Welcome to Extraordinary Women TV with Shannon Skinner. Well, I've got quite a show lined up for you today. In the first half hour, you're going to meet internationally critically acclaimed author Deborah Ellis. In the second half of the show, we're going to be talking about uh, what you can do for International Women's Day 2012. And of course, later in the segment, before we take a break, I'll have my regular Good to Know Minute when I ask my guests for their top success tip. You will hear Deborah's. Hello, Deborah Ellis. Hello, it's good to be here. Oh, well, it's great to have you here on the show. Now, you've achieved international acclaim with your courageous and dramatic books, 20 of them, mm -hmm. that give Western readers a glimpse into the plight of children in developing countries. You've won the Governor General's Award, Sweden's Peter Pan Prize, the Ruth Schwartz Award, many more, of course, and you've also been named to the Order of Ontario, and it is such an honor to have you here. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Now, of course, you're, you're, you're popular for your writing to the young people's market. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and 20 of them is quite a, mm -hmm. a feat. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> where I've been do you very find lucky. The, yeah, where do you find the time to write 20 books? Well, there's so many stories out there, so it's yeah. just a matter of going out and meeting people and getting people to be interested in what's going on in the world. Now, you do, you, you, you travel uh, and write pretty much full time. Yes, right now, um, yes. You travel to many, many countries around the world yeah. and writing about stories about children, both fiction and nonfiction. Yeah. Um, you've been writing since you were about 12. Oh, yes, but a lot of that has been unsuccessful. <laughs> so I've written <laughs> a whole bunch started. of books that were like, yeah, like, they were terrible books that <laughs> didn't get published. But that's part of the training that a writer goes through, I guess, and well, certainly my training until um, I got very, very lucky and Groundwood Books published my first book, which was Looking for X, and a book for, uh, geared to young readers. And then since then I've been able to do a whole lot of books on a whole wide, wide range of topics, although I kind of always write about the same thing. I write about the choices that we make and the impact of our choices right. and how we can learn to make better choices. And even though my books take place in Bolivia and Southern Africa and Afghanistan and all different kinds of places, it's essentially the same book over and over again, looking at courage, how do we find courage, how do we make courageous choices. So what's the universal, is this the universal theme that you see? Uh, it's, the, it's the universal thing that I'm interested in right. because we are faced with that, with having to make that decision many times in our life and sometimes many times in one day. Are we going to be courageous in this moment or are we going to not act with courage? And I find it fascinating to, to, to kind of explore how we make that decision. And a lot of the folks I deal with are having to make those kinds of decisions in, in a crisis situation, affected by war, affected by deep poverty, something like that. But even in this part of the world, if we're not dealing with those kinds of things, we're having to deal with other matters that require us to be courageous if we can be. Now, you, you, you were writing, at, you had the idea of writing when you were 12. Mm. What was it that sparked you to? Uh, know that one day you're going to be a writer. Well, I grew up in Paris, Ontario, mm -hmm. which is a small town, and I didn't have friends. I didn't know how to make friends. So reading and writing was my friend. It kept me company. So that's why I decided to become a writer. And then I got to meet the great Canadian writer, Jean Little. And mm -hmm. uh, boy, she's really something. And she kind of inspired me to, to try harder and go further. So did you, um, did you, did you, what did you do for education? Oh, I have grade 12. Okay. That's it. I, I didn't go to university. I, I had to get a job instead. So I did a lot of different jobs over the years and wrote and... And just kept writing. And just kept writing, yes. Kept writing and <laughs> kept traveling. Yeah. Now, why did you choose to write books for young people? I mean, we're talking about the age of about seven to, to teens. Yes. Um, as an adult, why, why did you choose to write for this market? Well, I got very lucky. Uh, mm -hmm. Groundwood Books, which published my first book, is a bu publisher for young people. But then I was in the Afghan refugee camps in Pakistan, meeting with families affected by the Taliban takeover of, Af of Afghanistan and the years of war that led up to that. And I, I heard the incredible stories of courageous children doing things that we I couldn't have even have imagined just in order, in order to support their families. Kids masquerading, girls masquerading as boys to go out and earn their families bread. Uh, people doing amazing things. And I wanted to share that kind of courage with kids back home so that they could learn from that courage and get some of that into their own lives. And since that time, that book was a success and I've been able to do the same thing in many different parts of the world. Now these, um 
you know, these children, you've met a lot of children, yeah. uh, and you've, 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 you know, in some cases you spend quite a bit of time with them. Um, what is it that drives you, that keeps you going? Well, these are folks that have lost everything, yeah. by and large. War, bad decisions on behalf of other people have taken away everything that they had in their lives. But they still get up in the morning. They still do the best they can. I've met kids who have lost their whole families, and they are looking after their younger brothers and sisters and still trying to do the very best that they can for, for them and their community around them. And that shows incredible courage. And so by, able to, by being able to meet them, it kind of reminds me that whatever difficulties I have, you know, just not that big a deal. When we look at courage, it's, um, you know, maybe courage is very uh, individual yeah. because what might be courageous to one person is maybe somebody else would not view that as being courageous. Mm -hmm. To be courageous to them might be something else. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's making, taking financial risks might yes. be courageous for someone, but, you know, maybe leaving your village to go get some water by yourself. Oh my uh, gosh, that's a life and death family. situation for a lot of people. So right. absolutely that takes courage. It takes courage to leave your country, even if you're in desperate situation. Uh, it takes courage, again, sometimes just to get up in the morning to face yet another day of living in mud and chaos and, and danger. Um, a lot of different kinds of courage, you're right. Now with these, um, you know, all the children that you spent time with, uh, how have they actually impacted your life? Or have they? Well, I don't have kids of my own. I've never had that kind of courage to do that. But I get to meet these young people. And sometimes I get very, very angry when I'm hearing their stories because the, the folks I meet with are in situations they are because other people have made stupid, mean decisions. And we could learn to make better decisions. So sometimes I get very angry thinking about that. Other times I get very excited and hopeful. I was just in Kabul a few months ago meeting with kids and finding out what had ha happened to them since the fall of the Taliban. And my goodness, there's some exciting young people over there. And doing, just reaching for every possible opportunity that, that they can find and running with it as fast as they can because they don't know when it's going to be taken away from them again. And if, if the world can kind of get off their backs and let them do what they need to do, they could make their country a garden again. I mean, wouldn't that be something for Afghanistan to be a garden again? And they could make it happen. So that gets very exciting. Of all the, the children that you've writ, uh, written about and heard stories, is there one that has really touched you deeply, touched your heart deeply? There are a lot of them. And I thought about whether or not I would relate an individual story. And I don't think I will, because the story I usually relate is, is one of sadness and hopelessness. But I don't think that that's really the situation. I think it's better to focus on the kinds of things that we can be hopeful about, because we can dwell in hopelessness ad infinitum, and it just doesn't go anywhere. But these are folks who have done incredibly courageous things and continue to do them. So by, for, for those of us who have the opportunities to have the tools at our disposal, if we can share those tools with people who have the drive and the, encourage, and the ingenuity to, to, to take them and do something exciting with them, then that's exactly what we should do. How do you choose what topic you're going to write about then? I mean, because you write on um, bullying, kids mm -hmm. in the drug trade, kids in war, obviously. Yes. Um, yeah. How do you choose the topic? It depends on what's going on in the world. And or it chooses you. <laughs> it chooses me, maybe, yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to write about the Afghan, the Iraq war from two different perspectives. So I did a book of interviews with children from military families who have a parent serving in the Iraq war and then children from the war in Iraq who are now living as refugees in Jordan. So I like to get kind of both perspectives so that we can see how much we have in common even though we have a lot of things that are different. And in this, um, one of the, the new books, No Ordinary Day, it's about leprosy. And so maybe we can just show the, the book cover on screen. Uh, okay. Right, so um, No or Ordinary so Day. I've yeah. been uh, a supporter of the leprosy mission for a long time and I wanted to do something to help them further. So I got to travel to uh, southern India, western India, and meet with people and, uh, who've been affected by leprosy and listen to their stories, learn about their lives, and the uh, things I heard impacted that book. Now, of course, we're going to talk a bit more about, um, about uh, you know, some of those issues that you faced uh, just after we take a break. But we're going to take a quick break. And Deborah, before we do, I know that you've got a great tip for the viewers. I find that when... I'm able to
consider that the work that I want to do is more important than the fear that I have of doing the work, then I'm able to move forward and do what I believe I need to do. There are times when fear can be very seductive, when it can be very, a very comfortable place to sit in. And we think, well, I'm too afraid. I don't have to move any further because I'm afraid to do so. But if we can take that step and we believe that what we're doing is more important than how fearful we are of it, that will help us to move on in our lives and make a success of it. Well, thank you so much for that. Thanks. Well, we'll take a quick break, and when we come back, more with author Deborah Ellis. So stay where you are. Welcome back to Extraordinary Women TV. I'm Shannon Skinner, and I'm joined by Deborah Ellis, who's an internationally acclaimed author uh, who's written about 20 books for the young people, and uh, we're having quite an inspiring conversation. Um, let's talk a bit more about your one of your latest books, okay. uh, No Ordinary Day. What is this book about? No Ordinary Day takes place in the great Indian city of Kolkata, and it's about a little girl named Valley who is all alone in the world, and she ends up in Kolkata on her own, kind of survives in her own special, unique way, and then a chance meeting with a doctor tells her that she has the disease of leprosy. And the book is not so much about leprosy as it is about Valley trying to find the courage to be able to trust people enough to move forward with her life. Now, leprosy is a disease that has struck fear into the hearts of humanity for thousands of years. It's one of the oldest recorded diseases in human history, and it attacks the nerves on people's extremities. So if you have it for a while and you don't get the cure, it starts to eat away at your fingers right. and your toes, your nose, your, your ears disappear. It's a very disfiguring disease, which is probably why it's been so feared. And it's also contagious. And in the okay, right. olden days, before we knew enough, we thought, even casual contact with somebody with the disease meant that we could get it. And there's still a lot of misconceptions about it nowadays. So even though we've learned a lot, there are still people affected by the disease that get shunted off into leprosy colonies, or their families kick them out of the home, or their, you know, their things are thrown at them in the street. And that's simply because the education hasn't happened enough. But we now have a cure for leprosy, which is very exciting. There are pills that people can take that uh, kill the germ that is in their body. We cannot repair the damage that's done to the nerves, so we right. can't grow the fingers back, but we can keep the disease from becoming contagious and doing further damage. It's a disease of choice right now for the human race because we need to make the, cho we need to, make the choice to put enough resources in, into it to wipe it out, which we could do. It's, it's, a, it's a solvable problem. And we simply need to make the choice that we're going to do it and we're going to solve it. And I don't even think it would be that difficult. Get the resources there, train the people to do it, and it's done. So why don't we? Oh, I think we're busy doing other things like fighting wars and, yeah. you know, doing those kinds of things. Um, and the people affected by leprosy, it's a small number compared to, say, people affected by cancer, for example. Right, yeah. Uh, but it's still one of those things that we could fix. So I think we should just fix it, get it done, move on. To the next thing. Of course, uh, proceeds of your book uh, go to the mission? They, they the go to the Leprosy Mission, mission of Canada, mm -hmm. which is uh, part of a global community of leprosy organizations. Uh, they run hospitals, they provide pills free of charge for people, they can help con people construct special shoes, often out of like old tires or whatever, so that the, the, their feet are cushioned properly against yeah. further injury. Right. Uh, they work on human rights work so that people have the education that they need to, to go forward in their community, community building activities. People affected by leprosy don't need to live in horrible situations. They can go on and go to school and graduate university and just do all the things that everybody else was meant to do if given the opportunity to do that. And the Leprosy Mission is one of the groups that's working toward giving people those opportunities. Now, um, I'm going to read an, uh, a little excerpt from your book. Okay. Thief, coal thief, coal thief. The others piled on top of me. I swung my arms and kicked and tried to get away, but I couldn't throw off so many kids. Throw her to the monsters. Let them eat her. That will teach her. I screamed. I pulled and twisted, but they hung on tight. They carried me over the railway tracks, and then they threw me, and I landed right in the middle of the monsters. So that's the scene where Valley's 
cousins or who she thinks are cousins. The heroine, yeah. Yeah, Valley, uh, they've attacked her and they've thrown her into the, the place by the railway tracks where people with leprosy are being made to live. And she believes that they are monsters who are going to attack her and, and destroy her. And so it's part of that fear that she has that she has to overcome when she realizes that she has got the same condition that they have. And is that a spoiler? I should we have it? Should I have a spoiler <laughs> alert? <laughs> um, now you chose to write this book uh, as a non, as yes. a as a fiction book of fiction rather than yeah. nonfiction. And I know that you have met um, children like her. Yeah. Why did you choose to write it in in as a fiction? I wanted it to be very very accessible to young readers, right. grade four and up. And sometimes we can ha have we can get stories into our head easier than we can facts. So I wanted them to identify with Valley, to really see themselves in her and her struggles. And I thought that doing it through a story would be a good way to do that. Well, it, this is a lovely book, uh, No Ordinary Day. Um, and uh, I really love the, I love the writing. And I love the little bit where she's sitting on the edge of a coal mine, dangling her legs. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, did you have... Um, did you work or to speak to kids that were working in coal mines there? I, mean, is that I something spoke to kids doing a lot of different kinds of, of labor. Right. Um, people who don't have a lot of money have to work really, really hard. Yeah. And that's one of the, the weird things, right? You'd think people who are rich should be working harder for their money, but it's the people on the very really low end of the spectrum that are doing all the backbreaking work in the world, and including, including a lot of kids. And in India, I mean, this young girl's... Um, getting coal for her family. Yes. She's breaking her back essentially right. carrying the coal. Yeah, the way a lot of children in a lot of places in the right. world do just to try to keep their families afloat and get something to eat at the end of the day. After all your experiences, I mean, how do you view children here in Canada? Do you look at children and think, wow, we've got it so good, so easy? Or do you just see it just actually just happens to be different choices that we make. We still have challenges that are just different. I think sometimes we don't have a lot of faith in our kids. We don't okay. trust that they have abilities and intelligence and capabilities of, of doing things in the world. And so we cushion them and, and protect them and put them in bubbles and think that they need to be entertained all the time rather than, you know, they, can, they have brains. They can entertain themselves. So I, th I think we need to have a lot more faith in the young people in our, in our own country to be able to do the great things that they're capable of doing. Now, what do you hope to achieve with, with this book? What, what's your vision? That, what do you want the readers, the young readers, to take away? Well, I want them to take away a couple of things. One is that people with leprosy, just the same as people with other kinds of diseases, are first, they're people. Yeah. And, and then second, they're people with abilities and talents and bad moods and good moods and everything else. And then way, way down at the end of the road, that's where their disease comes in. And we, the word leper is a word that I really think we need to strike from the human vocabulary. It's a word that's sprung up to refer to people with leprosy, but it's a word that's become the kind of word they use to, to shun other people. A label. A label, a yeah. bad label. And uh, my mother died of cancer a few years ago, but mm -hmm. we never referred to her as a cancer. <laughs> we right, said she had yeah. cancer, but she was all kinds of other things uh, in yeah. addition to someone with cancer. And so we need to get rid of labels like leper, like schizophrenic, like autistic, like all of that, and just refer to people, well, they have autism or they have cancer or whatever, but they all, a bunch of, they're a whole bunch of other people as well. Now you're you're best known, of course, for your book, uh, the Breadwinner Trilogy, and yes. this is uh, I love this cover. And I'm just yes. going to quickly show it because yeah. it's just so beautiful. Yeah. Um, How is this doing? I know this is sold like crazy around the world. It's it's fantastic. It's now in. It's just gotten into Iran. Yeah. So it's published in Persian, and uh, it's now going to be published in the Afghan languages for the first time, and wow. in Afghanistan, which I'm out of the moon excited about. How it's exciting is that? Yeah, it's really great, and I think it's it's really important that people see their lives reflected in, in literature and. and there's more and more Afghans now publishing their own stuff, which I think is, is better than anything I could do. But the kids I've talked to, especially from the Afghan communities who are now living in Canada, when they, when they read the book and they can see their experience, and it sort of begins to be a starting point for other discussions about refugees, about how we treat people, about the choices that we make. Now, you have another new book out, too, called True Blue. Yes. I just happened to have it right here. Oh, great. I'll just um, show the camera. Okay. Uh, this there one we are. here. Yeah. 
Uh, True Blue is a little bit different. It's uh, a, s a small town murder mystery, but it still involves the question of choice and how we make choices and the impact of our choices. And main characters are two girls who are teenagers, been friends forever. Yeah. They are at a camp, camp, camp counselors at a summer camp. One of their campers disappears, and one of the teenage girls gets charged with her murder. And it's about what happens to the friend who's left behind after her best friend is hauled away and charged with doing this terrible thing. So this is called True Blue. And Deborah, where can people find your books? Any old bookstore. They yeah. either have it or they can order it. And of course, libraries as well. OK, great. And what is next for you? Because I know that you're working on yet another project. Yes. Uh, one of the ones I'm working on now is a book of interviews with First Nations, Native American, Métis, and Inuit youth from all over North America. So I've been traveling to different communities, meeting with folks, learning about their lives, and that book will be out probably in another year or so. And the money from that book is going to the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society to help with Native youth in foster care. And this is something that I think is you know, I personally think it's really interesting about you is that uh, you're highly philanthropic with your with your royalties and giving back. Not only do you share the stories, but it's, it seems to be very important to you to, to make a financial contribution to to the cause. Well, that's the fun of it, right? Because yeah. you, you can turn out a book, but even after that, to be able to know that the book is working to build schools or to build battered women's shelters or whatever, I mean, that that's fun. That's good stuff. Deborah, you live so many people's dream. There's so <laughs> many people out there that are watching this that they dream about traveling the world and meeting interesting people and writing and being well, then, able to make a living doing it. Well, then they should just do it. I don't have any training. I just kind of do it. So yeah. they should just do it if that's what they want to do. Now, um, before we run out of time, there, there is one question uh, that I wanted to ask you. And, and because that you've seen uh, you've had so many incredible experiences uh, with young people around the world. Um, you've seen a lot. To you, what, what does success actually mean to be successful, to have a successful life, uh, in your words? I think to have a successful life or to be successful, to have as few moments as possible where you really think that you've done the wrong thing. And so you really strive to always do better and better and always be kinder and always treat people well. I think that's success. Well, that sounds like a, a good definition to me. Yeah. Well, Deborah, it has been such a pleasure having you here and hearing your story and uh, talking about your books. And uh, you're really inspiring, and you certainly inspired me. So Thank you very much. Thank and, you. And uh, hopefully we'll do a follow-up in the next little while, too. Already. So. It sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, uh, you're going to meet Janine Halliswell, who is here uh, all the way from Isla Mujeres, Mexico, to talk about uh, her upcoming event to celebrate International Women's Day 2012 called We Move Forward 2012. She, too, lives out of a suitcase, uh, but a very different journey, so stay tuned. <laughs>